All right. My name is David Von Lane. Uh, you can probably read what I'm up to. <laughs> okay, there's a little trick back there. If I fall over, <laughs> don't be surprised. Um, I want to tell a little story. I live out in the Bay Area, and there's a, a little company out there you might have heard of called Google out there. So I'm driving down the road, and I see a car go by, and it's got this spinning gizmo on it. And I look at the car, and there's a little thing that says, it says Google self-driving car. And I said, that's cool, because I've never seen one before. And it sort of pulls over into my lane. I'm all the way over in the right-hand lane. And I'm just watching this thing, because I'm curious about how, how they drive, you know? And so it keeps going a little faster than I am. There's a couple cars, one lane over, kind of pulls between them. I'm kind of watching, like, oh, gee, that's just what I would have done if I were driving. I was pretty happy at that, about that, pretty pleased that, you know, this thing is driving a very human-like sort of way. But then somebody in my lane pulled in front of the Google car, between the Google car and the car in front of it. And, like, it was not a lot of distance. I was happy with the distance for the Google car, but not when the other car pulled. My immediate thought was, oh, my God, don't you realize that car is being driven by a computer? So the point was... Up until that point, I wasn't thinking about it. But at that point, I went, oh my god, there's software there. And of course, well, as we all know, Linux is being used in all these experimental systems, including some systems that are actually not very experimental. They're pretty close to being in production. So a lot of these systems, either people, people's lives could depend on them, or they will soon depend on them. And with that in mind, I went, what are we doing as a community, as a Linux community? The, we are the keepers of the Linux ecosystem. What are we doing about this? So one question is, you know, should we be doing something to shut it all down, or what should we be doing? So that's what I kind of want to do, is talk about that a little bit. I have an opinion. It'll become uh, clear very soon what my opinion is. Uh, but let's go ahead and just sort of get started and talk a little bit about what's going on. Basically, part of, besides the fact that I like chocolate, and I like to share chocolate, Linux is sweet like chocolate. It is too sweet for people to pass up, people doing experimental R&D projects, people moving experimental R&D projects into reality. If you do a little search, you'll find a lot of things where people's lives, in one way or another, may depend upon what we do in the Linux ecosystem. By Linux ecosystem, I, I think that's pretty obvious, but just to make it clear, I mean not just the kernel, but the compilers and the libraries and everything else that's open source. So developing safety software, safety critical software, there's been a field for decades of people doing that. And they do things in a particular way, and they're very formal, and we don't use them. And we're not likely to ever use them. I mean, we got our own processes, and they are not the same. So the question is, is open source software, our Linux ecosystem software, reliable enough to risk using it when lives are at stake? Well, first answer, no. <laughs> Let's not do that. It's crazy. You need to know whether your application works out of the box. And unless you have strict processes, these processes that people have been using, you can't predict whether the software will work as soon as it's deployed. Now, sort of as an interesting aside, when I was looking up stuff, there's a lot of stuff out there talking about how uh, software, open source software, improves in reliability once it's been released. And that's good. I mean, we like to see that it improves in reliability. But when lives depend on it, it's got to be right as soon as it goes out the door. Anyway, this is not the answer that I believe. This is the answer I believe. Yes, there's a lot of open source software out of there. We have a lot of experience with it. And those of us, which includes folks in this room, folks in that room too, I can hear some of them, we know that actually it's really reliable. Now, there's few bugs that we come, in, uh, that we, uh, we come across as, uh, during deployment and, and maybe even during early test in the field. But it doesn't fail a lot. Uh, what I work with is primarily the kernel. And uh, I work for Cisco. There are over a million deployments of set-top boxes. 
and we didn't see kernel bugs coming back. This stuff just runs. So that's a pretty good indication that we're doing something right. There's a lot of work to do, and I'm going to go into some of that later. But just remember, if lives depend on it, you have to know that it works when you deploy it, which is a little different than most of us live with. So why should I worry about it? Why should you worry about it? Well, first off, people are going to use it anyway. Our lives, our personal lives depend on it. Insurance companies, once this gets out, they're probably going to make us do stuff too. It's what they do. And of course, we're engineers. It's a really cool challenge, like doing stuff where people's lives depend on it. Those are some pretty interesting applications. And it's a cool problem. OK, so what are we going to do? Boring thing. Reliability is attribute of the whole system. We know that, right? OK, just like power management, you got to get it all right, or you don't have any of it right. So it means that you measure things like frameworks, you got logging, restart for software, you worry about interfaces to hardware, methodologies matter too. But in open source, diversity is strength. We deploy all over the world. Different software configurations, different hardware configurations. We use different tools, different processes. Obviously, lots of versions. Uh, who was that, uh, the keynote speaker who said something about the 2.2 version of the kernel out there that they're looking at? It's scary. We don't want them to be using that. But there are lots of dirt versions, and different versions have different bugs. Obviously, we run a lot of different applications on top of our, our uh, Linux ecosystem. All of this diversity exposes a bunch of problems. I was just in the, uh, talking about the, the, what's it called? I've forgotten what it's called. The, anyway, static analyzer next door. Cool. Very nice stuff. Stuff that we are going to use in the future on the kernel as well as the other pieces of, of software. And these things, all those tools, but especially running in lots of configuration exposes lots of things like gray areas in the C definition. If you dig into it, you'll find there's little things that are not defined. There's also, you'll also find that we use things in the kernel that aren't really defined also in terms of uh, some of the special things about like signed versus unsigned and some of the things you can do with that. Configuration interactions, people run lots of different configurations. How do they interact? It's different. We do all, so much of that stuff that we uncover all kinds of bugs. That's a good thing. It means that open source is, in some sense, is like ball bearings. We know how to make ball bearings, right? When was the last time you had a ball bearing fail? Low round, hard thing, goes round and round and round. A lot of manufacturing knowledge came in, uh, went into creating ball bearings and the processes for making them. They're really, if you follow that, that process, it's really interesting how that evolved uh, from being maybe not able to make anything which is like round at all to making something which is very round and reliable. There's a lot of statistical techniques for analyzing how you make ball bearings. And because we've got all these interesting variations in how we deploy open, software, open source software, we can use a lot of those same techniques if we have the data. So we can get things like mean time to failure, or things like mean time to repair, which is really good if you're building from bits and pieces of open source systems. Another cliche, you get what you measure. So you have a process. And the way that, that I think that we begin to look more like ball bearings is you collect data. And that's going to be an interesting thing. We'll talk about that just a little bit more. You crunch data. You analyze it and publish it. And then in our community, you flame for a while, and then you think. And then you talk, and you study, and you learn, and you code, and then you do it again until you've got something really good. And we're really good at doing this. What we don't have is enough data from enough different sources being combined to come up with a really good, broad answer as far as how reliable our software is. So you get one-of-a-kind systems. And you know some of the ones I was listing up at the beginning they're likely to resemble something existing, which is not really that true in a proprietary system, because they don't have as many different kinds of systems out in the field. 
You also have, if you have that kind of data, you have the possibility of tweaking your particular safety critical Linux so that it looks like an existing one. So if you're worried about interactions between configurations, well, why not make your configuration more like something that somebody else has already tested and knows works? So ultimately, you get better pre predictability, which is really great, and then you get better reliability, which is like even better if people's lives depend on it. So what can you do? What can we do? Well, I got a few things, and I'm sort of winding down, and we're going to talk. I hope I get some interesting ideas, because that's what this is really all about. But the first thing is, we need to get a logging and reporting infrastructure so that we take more data and that we can report it in a common format, or at least we can turn it into a common format, from user space, from kernel space. So we collect all this stuff, and then we can dump it into, and then this will be another thing, the number crunching part. So we need to be able to analyze what our failures look like and, and report that so that we get our, the statistics. If you do this to Linux, the Linux kernel, and you do that to BusyBox, you get something which is really reliable, or, or not, in which case you stay away from it. Obviously a website, because you always got to have a website. More things that we can do to get a more reliable Linux ecosystem. Frameworks. Now some of these things exist, I know, uh, from past history in, in various proprietary forms. But I don't really see a lot about them uh, when I look at people who are trying to deploy things where people's lives depend on it. So frameworks for restartable computation. So checkpoint restart. Not on the whole process standpoint, but, uh, on the, uh, but, but from the individual computation. So fine, fine granularity. Uh, control applications, cars, rockets. They have lots of sensors which fail, so a framework which can take uh, data from sensors, integrate it, and tell actuators you know, what to do. An actuator is sort of anything, a motor, a rocket motor, uh, you know, a rudder on an airplane. So the ability to gather data and to uh, disperse it into, as commands is really important, and a way to do that reliably is a good idea. Now, is there stuff out there that does that? Yeah. Is it open source? Not as far as I know, although some of it's probably integrated into open source robotics toolkits. But it's not independent enough that people can just take that and use it. And we really want them to be reusing that software because that's where the reliability comes from. And that's where our predictability comes from. Uh, other things, hardware. Well, if you are a kernel person, and I know that we have more than a few kernel people in this room, uh, what are the requirements on what the hardware has to do when the software fails? Uh, okay, watchdog. Well, exactly what should an interval of a watchdog be? Um, when you boot, how long a watchdog do you set to make sure that the kernel comes up properly? Things like that. There are cases, there's cases where you might solve a problem with software, you might solve it with hardware case that I recently myself uh, had some interaction with is dealing with cache errors. Well, you can solve a cache error in many cases by invalidating a line of cache, throw away the data, reread it from memory. But in other cases, uh, you might want to just reboot the system because not all the cache errors are recoverable. And some of them, you know, you, you don't necessarily know whether you actually recovered it correctly. Was it reported correctly? Uh, when will soft reboot work, or when you have to actually shut the power off? This is something that is not traditionally considered when you look at the Linux software ecosystem. But it's part of the interface to the hardware, and as such, we own the software part of it. Cute things. ECC, error correction parity. Uh, I've worked on a lot of systems that have none of that. and. Uh, I, 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 heard, I hear at least one chuckle out there. In other words, you get error reports coming in from the field, and you don't know, really, whether it was a software error or a hardware error. You get no indication. It may very well look like a software error. Uh, companies that have a lot of deployments, uh, things that have of, of boxes that, for example, have no parity error or anything, there's a certain fraction of those errors that are really hardware. They may look like software, but they're not. So that makes it a little harder to diagnose, and we'd like to have that diagnosed, but we'd also like to know, just you know, 
be clearer on when it is that uh, we've got when we've got good information from like ECC protected memory. We've got mm, maybe questionable information if it's just got parity, or where there's just a risk we don't know what the heck happened because it has nothing at all. More things to do, and this 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 is where I'm hoping to get some feedback from everybody here. Better define goals. Encourage data sharing. We don't get to safety critical software of any sort without data sharing. If we're doing open source, we really need to get a lot of companies involved. And you see, I, I listed a bunch of companies, and really what I'm after is a broad variety of companies. And I mean, this is a pretty broad variety of companies and organizations. I mean, NASA, for example. They have a big stake in reliable software. So I want to get them to have some, some skin in the game. And I think the people at NASA are actually pretty interested in, in, in that sort of thing. Uh, expand the community. Academics are traditionally not that involved in open source software. There are some exceptions. Um, there's one I know at least, uh, did Matthew uh, show up? I, th I thought I saw him show up anyway. Uh, so yeah. Right, but not a lot of them show up here. And this is where the rubber meets the road. So yeah, I mean, they use a lot of open source software and they may publish it. Um, I think that it's probably better than it was, say, five years ago, where you're starting to get, and, and, and you're not as old as, say, I am. So um, you grew up more with open source software and you actually kind of, in, it's in your bones a little bit more than, than some of the other folks. And I think that's a good thing. You, you understand a lot more intuitively about community. You know, the academic community will probably have a separate open source community as such for mostly research related problems. I don't know if they're going to be as motivated to make reliable long term computing, though. I, I think that that. Like, as an internal, like, organizational motivation, right? Yes, I, I think that that's in part true. Uh, however, I think that we offer a degree of excitement in open source that's a little bit hard to do. Um, if if we're successful and we can actually, as a community, really push for reliability, then you come into an arena that hasn't really existed before. So most academics, they go out and they either do some broad but fairly thin survey or they go do something deep within a single company. What if we can actually do something that's both broad and deep? I think that's, that's more exciting than you know, what's been done before. So on uh, carry grade Linux, and I know also in a, bun a number of more old school uh, um, big iron servers, uh, there's this concept of reliability and serviceability. How is this any different than RAS? I, I could have paid you to ask that question. Yeah, well. this, is, this is certainly not the, the first time that See, somebody no, brought up the concept of reliability and open source. Um, and in fact, carry grade Linux, um, the OSADL has had for years on something out there to do that. There's something called OpenDO. These are much more top-down efforts. What I'm looking for is something where we, as engineers, step up to whether we believe that we're, we're safe using Linux and the Linux ecosystem. Uh, in things where you know, lives really matter. So this is nothing if, if nobody, nobody in this room does anything. Yeah, but all the, all the things you, most of, most of the things you put on your slide were really reliability related things. Yes, Logging, they are. Restarts. They are, but this, I mean, is, this is the ultimate extension. That's RAS stuff, right? Yeah, this is the ultimate extension. It's not new in kind, it's new in extreme. In other words, so it's different. Uh, well, well let, let, me be, let me be particular. Okay. Uh, I worked at SpaceX. Okay. They plan in two years to launch astronauts. Their flight software 
is Linux. Yeah. It's not VxWorks. It used to be, actually, but it's not anymore. They use the real-time patches, which is a little scary, since those are less exercised than, than the rest of the kernel. But they're actually going to fly people. They're not carrier grade. This is the next level up. This is the ultimate level, where your life and my life in an airliner running Linux, not tomorrow, but some years in the future, I don't see that companies are going to be able to resist the allure of open software. There's people like, like, yeah, like, but like this younger person so, here. I mean, and I mean that in a good way. Uh, in other words, so this is not anything new in terms of reliability. This is something new in terms of what we do about it. This is things about getting data that we're not currently collecting, going to different companies to collect them. This is driven, what I want to do is to drive something from the bottom up to make that happen. I mean, like from Ubuntu perspective, once we started looking into the phones and the question came up, if somebody installs new version of Ubuntu and a package breaks the dialer and suddenly somebody dials 911 and they don't get through and they die, who's going to sign off on that package update, mm -hmm. right? And that question came up and then we started to look into all the ways we can collect our crash and error reporting data. So at the moment we have uh, Whoopsie, which collects all of the crashes across all of the Ubuntu installations. And it does go into Cassandra database and we do harvest the data and publish it. And if you do sign an agreement with us, you can get even further access within the data because some of it is private or personal in some jurisdictions. So if you go to errors.ubuntu.com, you can see the statistics and all of the errors and crashes that we see. And most of those bugs were never reported. Mm -hmm. Yet That's we automatically collected them, identified them, bucketed them, yeah. and we see histograms of when the bugs spin up and when we release updates, we see them drop down and we now know that it takes two weeks for people to upgrade their packages, you know, and things mm -hmm. like that. So we publish our data. We'd like more data yeah. <laughs> because we analyze it and we react upon it. Okay, well, let me ask you a question. First off, I'm very aware of, of, of what you're doing, yeah. uh, partly be just because I see the little air thing pop up way too often. Okay, but that's, yeah. you know, whatever, I, you know. Uh, I mean, we are working on non-interactive UI as well, such that you can sign up to not see the pop-up. Right. Well, I'm, 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 happy, I'm happy to see that, but I, you know, the average user probably isn't. I, I, you know, I go, oh, okay. Well, the only thing I worry about is, well, I sent the data, you know, an, an, an error report for this yesterday and the day before, and you know, I don't want to bother people with too many errors and stuff. Well, let me ask you a question: How many folks here are involved in things like, at least one way that know of data collection from the products that they're working on? This is a very good number. So let me ask the hard question: If we came up with a way to report it anonymously, because that really is important, but also anonymously because we don't care about all that data. We actually care about a, a much smaller subset of data, and reporting too much data is not really interesting. So if we came up with a way to do that, um, and you know, we provided a framework for various uh, uh, pieces of open source software to report uh, user space software to report its errors, as well as you know, finishing the last few little ties, making it standard on, on the kernel. How many people think that your company might possibly, I know you're not being committed here, might possibly be willing to contribute that data into a common pot? Most likely never. I, I, see, I see a few hands. I mean, Google has written an open source project called BreakPad. It, Which, the entire purpose is to automatically gather crash data, produce a mini dump. Well, this, this, this may be a perfect thing to I start mean, this with. Is, this is how Chrome works with all of its crash reporting. Is that Okay. Yes. This not not you today. Don't, you don't get access to the crash reports. <laughs> well, no, but you mentioned framework. And yes. Google no, yeah, yeah he's, he's addressing the framework the thing. So, so maybe we have a framework that's useful. Does, does that apply user space as well as kernel, kernel space? or? So when it comes to Chrome, the browser on your desktop, it only applies to Chrome. If you talk about Chrome OS, Chrome OS actually has all crash reporting for the kernel 
for all system daemons for the browser itself. Life, life is good. And not just crashes, but actually like um, warnings from drivers. So okay. if you get a kernel warning. OK. Uh, oh, can uh, we get the microphone back there? So um, one of the key tenets of safety critical development is you remove everything you don't want. So your, your whole point of diversity you know, requires extra drivers for USB things and you know, extra components you don't have on your safety critical systems, which you're going to remove when you're running a safety critical application. So cool. some common data sharing tool would have to be you know, developed the whole safety critical standards, which are very costly, including the testing aspects of it, to convince people to be able to put it on safety critical tools because it's easier for them to just remove that code than to test it. I, I agree what you're saying for the most part. Um, however, what, uh, because of the existence, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of safety critical applications are gonna be based on systems on a chip. So the hardware is gonna be there. And given that the hardware is gonna be there in a lot of cases, what you're gonna, not all cases, but in a lot of cases, I think what you find is, is that people use that hardware for debugging and they just leave it there. So they may actually not be safety critical software specialists. And so they just leave USB drivers, which are huge. I mean, that's, that's a lot of code, right? And they just leave it in because to not do it means that they can't slip in a little thumb drive and you know, take, copy things off or put things on. So maybe poor practices are followed in some systems, but you really don't want that code there if you don't need it, right? Well, but part, of the point, part of the point is we've lost, honestly, we've lost control. People are going to use Linux for, for uh, safety critical systems. I, and, and we're never going to regain the kind of control that, that, say, somebody like a Wind River and a VxWorks have. We're never going to have that. That's my belief. But what we can do is do the best so if it turns out, for example, in my example, you, the USB driver is not really an indication of reliability, that whether or not you have it, it seems to behave the same, then we've learned something really important, which is that it's all right to leave the USB driver in. I think you need more than it seems to behave OK, though. Oh, uh, the better the standards we can set, the better off we'll be. I agree. Uh, but we're never going to go back to the traditional reliability software. I, I, I truly believe this. It's like it was working for SpaceX was an interesting experience. And uh, the way that they approach it is it works. So let's fly it. So okay. <laughs> That's going to be pretty common. I would like to improve on that attitude. I would like to arm ourselves and them and every other company that's going to build safety critical systems on Linux with data that says, don't include the USB driver. Or actually, I have nothing against the USB driver, all right? <laughs> I, but I, I think approaching it from the other end of the testing, having tests that exercise those drivers is possibly more important. And let's go back to his point, which is, why is this different? In a sense, it's not, but the urgency drives it. So having tests for those things is driven by the urgency. All of a sudden, somebody's life depends on it. Well, it becomes more urgent to do the test of the USB driver or any other driver. Can somebody <laughs> give me another drive to, to pick on? I, 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 I actually, I, I really like the USB driver, even though it's huge. <laughs> Can we? Um, but then when it comes to QA okay, could time... You, wait, I'm sorry, could you back up? I heard something about Android and then I didn't hear um, So I'm a much software engineer, Android kernel team, and there's some of the drivers that we left in there um, for some of the release. We had like FM drivers, radio FM drivers in the kernel. And the reason why we don't care about them is because they're dead code. So sometimes we realize, oh crap, we forgot to remove this from our configuration. We just leave them in there because they're never going to be activated. So when people talk about USB, there's a lot of USB code it's never going to get triggered unless the hardware says, hey, that's it, somebody's got something plugged in. Um, yep. And, oh, and about yep. sharing, one of the reasons why we don't really share kernel crashes is because it's going to potentially leak user data. 
Yes, and we have we to just be, can't afford it. So there's it like is, five people who are allowed to look at them. It's very legitimate to not leak user data. We don't really want to do that. But neither do we not want to do that, but we don't need to do that. Yeah, uh, and another thing, you know, I, I'm just of the opinion that you can, you can only test software so much, but at the end of the day, this safety critical or the reliability, you're testing a system. You need a specific device or target that you're mm -hmm. really tracing. You're not on a phone. So I work on Android phones at Intel, and we have all sorts of logging data, and it's, it's horrendous. We got tons of stuff we get, right. you know, um, on, on, the, on the internal testings. But, you know, like, that doesn't mm -hmm. go out to the customers. They, they get their own telemetry mm -hmm. data. But <clears throat> it, the reliability comes from testing the system. Mm -hmm. over and over and over again. And, and really, I, I, other than putting in handy logging infrastructures, I don't know what else you can really do other than you know, put in the logging, test the shit out of it, fly it. Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> he said fly it too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I did. I mean, this, this doesn't get you away from testing. In no way does it get away from you away from testing. But I mean, if you if you step back and you look at, at things in the kernel, especially um, a really good example, I think in the kernel is um, a lot of the locking stuff. There is some really cool. I, I don't know if you've you've looked at that stuff. There's some really cool stuff that lets you um, find out whether your locking is broken. Yeah, yeah. There's lock verifier, and there's a number of other things. Yep. Yeah. Some really, really excellent stuff, and that stuff that finds things that you won't find by testing, and you may find it, you know, one in a million times in in reality. But you know, that millionth time, if somebody dies, it's a bad thing. Yeah. So, I am but, not saying don't test. But now you're talking about code correctness, proving, you know, you know, provability. Yeah. Of code correctness. And I'd that's, love that's, that's if that's we a could. Different, yeah. I, uh, I agree. I, I, this, this, doesn't, this doesn't change anything that we right. do in a sense. We still test. We still do as much as we can to prove code correct. Um, but the other thing we do is we share data with each other and find out what actually works. Uh, what data exactly? So our crash data, Just, specifically. OK. So um, and this is something where if we can get together. Now, I, I, can, I believe. I very strongly I believe in the Linux ecosystem. The, the question that was asked of me is basically, would you, would you fly in a rocket with Linux software? And, and I thought about that one a lot. I actually literally thought about that for weeks. It wasn't the only thing I did. I did other things too. But I thought about it for weeks. And the I answer would. was yes. And then the next question that comes is, can you prove that to someone else? That you yeah, you, that it's okay to do that. Oh, that you, it's safe to do that. And we don't know the answer to that yet. Flying a rocket's not safe. So it's not, it's, <laughs> it ought to be safe. It ain't. <laughs> but, but still, okay, we've one got, of the I things that bugs me about the kernel crash dumps that we mm -hmm. got today is the kernel. Uh, really, we, all we do is dump the log buffer. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that really, I think that's, that, that text information is just not quite complete. And I. I I probably want to talk to you a lot about yeah. that. Um, but there's some folks back there. And, and as you're passing the microphone, I'll just mention one of the things I did at Cisco was to greatly enhance the crash reporting uh, structure. So it reported you know, all kinds of things, memory. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember. Do you remember what all things we had in there? There's a bunch of things. Yeah, well, there's the backtrace, of course. Everybody has a backtrace. But it reported a lot of things that are in the proc file system. Uh, which is a little hard to do, but um, so that, yeah, yeah, getting more information, getting the right information in order to categorize the errors is is really important, and 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 I've got lots of ideas I'd like to bring forward, but you know, one thing at a time. Yeah. So um, when you say would would we find it acceptable to have Linux drive the car for us, do you consider that Linux implies a certain level of hardware complexity oh, wait, you, that could, becomes wait, untestable? Wait, could, you, could you hold on a sec? If you guys are having a discussion on this, I would love everybody else to share it. Um, otherwise, yes, I'm talking to you. If you guys are talking about this subject, that would be great. And, and I would love you to share it. If, if not, if you could just hold that on until we're done, I would appreciate that too. 
Uh, does, does the Linux reliability covered here include the fact that Linux implies a certain level of hardware complexity that, in my experience, is guaranteed to fail? Okay, that's a very strong statement. Does it? Um, I've worked at Transmenta, Montalvo Systems, where we did asymmetric CPUs, mm -hmm. and I've seen data from Google, both at data centers, and I used to work for Phoenix Technologies BIOS, and I've seen chipset failures that are just freaking incredible. And the hardware manufacturers will hide those from the public. Well, that's kind of one of the things that's not, we don't do that in open source, do we? We have a lot of discussions where people say just what you said. You know, actually, if you could say that again, uh, I would appreciate I it with, with the microphone. And, and actually, there was, there was somebody back there, I think, who had a comment. Did you? Uh, I didn't see exactly who was raising a hand, but. <laughs> um, okay. So in, for the automotive stuff, there's like a couple of standards that cover reliability. Um, and for some things like Google Chauffeur, they've got um, redundant systems. And the final system, when everything fails, it's, it needs to stop the car without killing anybody. Those are running on the smallest possible systems. The OS is all like hand-coded. The hardware is extremely simple yes. because it has to work. CPUs uh, never work. And that, uh, Think about caching on ARM. Oh, my, my, my God. Slide, my slide has disappeared. Yeah. It fell asleep. Wake up. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yeah, typically safety-critical things are done with a, a small, you know, preferably like a, even an 8-bit microcontroller in a while one loop. Yeah. And it just does one thing. Uh, uh, <laughs> I, uh, the, my, one of the things that we should do for safety critical systems is disable sleep. Um, <laughs> I think it's actually just gone to sleep. No, if you anyway, want your battery to be reliable. Oh, uh, let's see. <laughs> hold, hold on just a sec. Um, anyway, that actually, the, the reason I'm trying to get this thing to, to, to come back alive is, is because that's one of the questions I have about hardware. So, how much do you rely on the software, and at what point do you have the hardware back up the software? And um, it's, that's not an easy question. It's, in fact, it's a very difficult question. It's one that um, uh, some people want to punt and just say, hey, it'll just always work. I don't, I'm not happy with that. Uh, so just trying to get a consistent, uh, a realistic example, you're talking about like, let's say, um, a software driven battery charging uh, implementation versus a, you know, embedded microcontroller battery charger. Software controlled battery charger, it could catch fire or damage your... They've been known to. Yeah. Where, or uh, microcontroller. Is that, is that what you're referring to? Is something along those lines? I'm referring to right now everything. Um, and it, because it's a big spectrum, I, I, I mean, this is not me telling you. It's just me, you telling me. Uh, let's see. Oh, boy. Got to go back. So uh, the, the spectrum of things... Um, that need to be covered. I mean, for battery control, you're probably not using Linux. It's going to yes, be way too are. expensive. <laughs> well, battery controller on a phone. Okay, then maybe you are using Linux. That's true. It's a piece of, people of the are. software. Uh, it, but. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. there and the charging logic is implemented in a ba in a battery driver. Something. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's, uh, as I understand, I'm not a battery guy. Um, but uh, I'm just saying, if you charge it wrong, on a good day, all you do is break your, re oops. remove your battery life and your battery's toast. Yeah. On a bad day, you might there's, smell smoke and see flames. There's some, uh, as I understand it, there is some kind of hardware which is usually, or hardware and software, some very small microcontroller in batteries themselves. Some batteries, yes. Uh, that's probably not running Linux. That is. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, com completely. <laughs> now, 
Sorry, I forgot that point. Yeah, um, by, by the way, I should warn you that if you ever sit next to a flight attendant and, and you tell her that you will soon be on the ground one way or the other, she does not laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand that. So yeah, so, um, apparently there's a lack of you. I okay. think one problem you're going to have with collecting the data is it will quickly become very old. Because yeah. like he said there, you're testing the whole system. So any, any company that's testing a system is going to be reluctant to rebase. You know, mm -hmm. so, because then but, they have to start over essentially. Right. But that, so our that's, pace is, a, is, a, is going to be a problem for these systems. Uh, but I think that that's, that's, that's sort of two, cuts two ways. I mean, uh, what, I mean, if, if I were the king of the world, which, which I'm not, which is probably good for everybody else, but if I were the king of the world, you know, I would probably want to focus on a few versions of the various pieces of software. Um, but uh, I hope you're sort of involved there. Actually, if you can, you can share what you... Yeah. I mean, yes, crash data gets old, but sometimes when you identify crashes and when you try to bucket them and predict and look at the traceback and see how similar it is, you realize that some bugs happen for years and years and years, despite newer and newer versions of yeah. software being uploaded and uploaded and uploaded, and the bug is still there. Right. Uh, so, yes, some crash data is very volatile, Others, or most of the time, it's actually not that volatile at all. Yeah, but that's true, plus I would expect. In I mean, practice. We, uh, the folks who have deployed embedded systems, been doing that for a while, you know that upgrading to a new version of the software, even if there's like pretty good reasons for it, is very painful, getting management to check off. Well, it works, why do you want to do this? Well, because it will do more and it will be doing it faster. Yeah, but it's already working, but it's better, but, but it works. Yeah. Well, actually, I want you to automate your testing so that it's only 1,500 man years, but that's a separate issue. There's someone back there. Yeah. Yeah, so I have a few different uh, ideas and Great. thoughts. Um, first, on the different levels of, of safety. So. Uh, let's back up. I, I work with the Geneva Alliance, which works on infotainment systems uh, for cars, uh, defining a Linux uh, Linux platform. And uh, so that's not uh, safety critical systems, but you'd be surprised how often that sort of creeps in. The well, if you have little kids, having them working entertainment system yeah, is that, that's, sort of safety that's critical. Not, uh, <laughs> that's not the one, but uh, oh, okay. Yeah, but uh, we have the um, the ISO 26262 spec, which you haven't mentioned, but I guess you're aware of it. The, there's a functional safety specification for for cars. And, and so just to uh, tie on to what you said, that has different uh, levels of safety defined and what you need to do, basically. Um, that That's w at least one place where you can find a sort of grades to to use when we talk about what level of, of safety is needed for different functions. And um, I was going to say that surprisingly, surprisingly often the uh, requirements sort of creep in into these infotainment systems. For example, if you need to play a warning sound for the, for the driver and the um, car company in, in question believes that that is a, in fact a critical warning sound that must, must be played or uh, you must be aware that the system cannot play the sound or something like that. And becomes a safety critical system. Um, um, sorry for rambling on, but I have a few different ideas. Uh, I want to mention uh, just you. You uh, one little detail that you talked about was logging. Um, so Geneva has a system called the Diagnostic Log and Trace, uh, a component that is very um, flexible when it comes to runtime logging. So I'd I'd like to make you aware of that and and. Uh, and check it out if you're interested in that. It's not designed for crash logs, however, uh, but quite often the, um, this request comes for, to us in Geneva. So I want to say that we're interested in, in working on that and figuring out how we should standardize uh, crash log in, in the Geneva systems and work with whoever is interested in that. And see, obviously, this has been invented many times already oh, yeah. by the, the rest of the people in the room, so. I know, we, 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 in, we invented and we invented and we invented and then, then we don't ever get it back into yeah. 
And but then I finally have a question for you. Uh, when you say about would you talk about sharing uh, sharing crash log data, wouldn't that imply that we need to have a very uh, similar or uh, even the same uh, platform, everybody, like uh, running the same kernel version or um, something like that to, be, to actually make it um, useful, the, the data that we, we pool together? Well, it all, all depends what, how good a job we do. Um, you know, the more data of different types, the better. Because um, just to a very large extent, the more, the more diverse versions and the configurations, hardware and software and applications are, the better idea we'll really get of how reliable the system is when you, when you vary things. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's a good point. But then once you want to harden the system, you sort of move towards a very much more controlled yeah, uh, and, single uh, setup sort of thing. And, and there are, um, there are communities that standardize around particular kernel releases, for example. And, yeah, like um, the LTSI, long-term support kernel, things yes, like that. Yes, things like that. So, so various organizations, for various reasons, do standardize on, on particular kernel versions. And I suspect that probably um, you know, a smart person developing a Linux-based safety critical system would pick something that somebody else has already decided is pretty reliable. Um, you know, sort of matching that against something which is current and, uh, you know, well supported. So it's, uh, I, again, I, I don't have all the answers. I'm, I'm here more to raise questions and to, to hear you guys raise questions and sure. kind of get things started. Now, I don't, I don't want to um, close off discussion. I do want to just mention briefly um, that, and I, I already put this up, uh, the, the, the last couple of bullet items here on it, it's like, if these, you folks, think this is a good thing, then I'd like to continue this discussion. Uh, perhaps eventually within a, an organizational framework like the Linux Foundation, uh, I don't know whether they're interested at all, but they might be. I've heard they are interested in Linux, so. Uh, uh, meeting again, an obvious candidate it is about six months, uh, I've forgotten when it is, April? The next embedded Linux conference. So what I'd like to do, and I'm getting basically I'm getting a sense that there's a lot of people that are actually really interested in this, and so um, I'd like to target the next ELC, and then following that, maybe the next Linux Plumbers conference to just start keep sort of a regular series of birds of feather sessions. Does this make sense to all y'all folks? Thank you. Here, let me pay you. That was really nice of you. Uh, I have already set up a, a Google group for discussion. I've heard a number of topics already discussed. Um, oh. Yes. The most case, I think I can speak loud. Uh, but for the most case. Yeah, but we can't record you. Unless, yeah, but for the most that. case, we're just talking about standard RAS stuff and, and mm -hmm. you know, state logging, runtime logging, and right. cache logging. All of which about, is true. Are we doing this do as a joint effort? Do we have anything more specific? We're not doing this as a joint effort. It's to take uh, that stuff and put it together. Right. And the goal is to be able to get enough data that we can actually really say something that, frankly, proprietary software can't. We want to be able to say something about this stuff is reliable to this degree. Go ahead and use it. Or, or honestly. This hardware configuration, you yep. these use cases. Exactly. That's exactly right. But if we That's, say stuff like that, well, the, the nice thing about doing survival analysis is it lets you, and doing statistical analysis, mm -hmm. is it actually lets you pull out the individual factors. Mm -hmm. But only if we get enough data. So one of the things I'm asking folks is, can you go to your company and start probing and saying, under the right conditions, you know, you're gonna ask what the right conditions are later. Under the right conditions, would you be willing to contribute to an effort, contribute reliability data? And, and I don't, I mean, most of us are already taking it. Uh, some of us are actually actively sending it on a network. Some of us store it on a device so that when the device is returned, but most all of us are taking it already. 
and we're all taking it in different formats and yeah, cut, cut and exactly. different ways. So I think it might be more interesting to have perhaps talk about a more standardized yes. data structures on how you log this stuff before yeah. we start talking about sharing, you know, last year's I'm I'm real I'm effort, real yeah, happy right? to anything anybody wants to do to standardize this. And there's you know some frameworks out there already, but they're not being used widely. They're not exported. Google does have somewhat of a track record of making things available publicly. So I would certainly, you know, knowing that there's something that Google's got, uh, would, would be very interested in that. Um, what, one thing I do want to send around is a sign up. Uh, anybody who is interested in being signed up to the Google group, just write your, write your name down. Let's start over here. Um, but I want to keep discussing things. I mean, you're right in the sense that this is, this is all standard RAS stuff, but the important thing is we're not doing it jointly. We're not doing it as a, a, an open effort um, to really allow us to evaluate things. My feeling is that open source, you know, something based on open source done right, is going to be far safer than what has gone before. I would like to prove that. Oh, I give, give this man a QP doll. I, I mentioned insurance companies. Lawyers are almost synonymous in some ways. It's going to be a real issue. No. Well, bear in mind, I'm not actually asking right now. I'm not asking for, for safety critical data. I'm, I'm actually steering clear of that because <laughs> it is it is. It is. It is. And uh, what I'm asking for, some companies are not going to provide because it is a competitive edge. But the only thing is it's not a competitive edge until it's actually available. And I want anonymous data. And I would even suggest some ways that that can be done. But I mean, uh, we don't I have mean, enough time right now. But, but I mean, like personal data in UK, uh, any personal identifying yeah. information yeah. is considered private. Right. So for example, if you say that something crashed in home slash Dmitry Slatkov slash blah, 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 mm -hmm. you can't share that because my username happened to be right. my name and last name. That's personally identifying right. information. Yeah. We've tried I to agree. sanitize it. It's yep. pretty much impossible to sanitize across the board. Oh, I'm not so sure how much, because you don't need a lot of information. I don't, I don't want that information. It doesn't tell me anything. True. It, it, you're right. So I, if anything but we can do to get rid of that. But it's very easy to leak that. accidentally. Yeah, we want to, as much as possible, we want to get that out of the, out of the record, because it's, it's extraneous. So another thing, too, about like personally identifying information is that uh, I worked at Ironport on their web security device, right? And so you have HTTP logs, and obviously, Right. So the big part you can do also is you have to identify exactly what makes it valuable. It's not necessarily invaluable, but we used a series of hashing techniques based on your customer ID, time, other things, just so that way you can correlate for that hour the same, that this is the same URL. You don't care what the URL is or that who visited it or other things, but the fact that you can say this is the same thing can be just as valuable as saying it was, you know, Facebook.com or whatever else, right? Yeah. <laughs> I have no comment about sharing. A million crash reports in another app, too. You know they have about twice as many installs, right? Right. And, th and that's, that's, that's a risk. Uh, what's the payback for a company of sharing reliability data? Yeah, that's a good question. It's more reliable open source. In other words, we have a lot of data that's, that's out there, and it's being kept by a company, and they may do patches or they may not do patches. We're all about open source. We really want that stuff to be more reliable. So yeah. there is a benefit to companies, and there's a cost to it. The, but there are other ways to achieve the same benefits, I believe, and I think trying to get companies to share all this data is a very difficult path to track on, and mm -hmm. I think there, there are other paths that will get you similar results in easier ways. Great. Tell us all about them. So if a company is gathering crash reports with tools that you've made easy for them to use it, they can contribute bug fixes, right? Which they mm -hmm. do. Yes. You don't need to know how they found that bug. That's true. So maybe having the tools that allow them to collect the data makes sense, but not mm -hmm. having, not pushing for the central repository. OK. Um, I don't know. That's, I, I would need more time to think. But 
you just off the top of my head, I think the central repository is a is a big it, yes, and it, I don't care how we sure. get an idea I mean, how reliable it is. The important uh, thing is that we do get an idea of how reliable it is. Um, we don't have enough manpower to fix every crash report we get, such that even if you look at our top 100, something below top 30, we can't keep up with fixing it. So we'd like to have more manpower, but that means opening up our crash data, which gets you into the legal issues of opening up your crash data. Sorry? Opening it up, yeah, giving people access. Because I'm sure there are people who can look at the crash report 1000 and see that it's a one liner fix and fix it. Yeah. Is that notebook making, made its way to the back yet? Does anybody know where it is? <laughs> yeah, it's old fashioned. All right, so how many folks go to ELC? Got a few, okay. Um, obviously, you folks come to LBC, so that's good. Um, is there a better forum where people would be something, something sooner than a year from now that, that people would be, because this is, this is something which is in need of definition, definition, and that's usually done better in part, oh, okay. Done in better in part, at least in person. Is there a better forum where we should like anything else people go to in six months or so? Or just, we'll just do it and see who shows up. Maybe an entirely different crowd, I, I have a feeling now. Okay. So more comments. Is this crazy? Okay. <laughs> Doesn't bother me. You need the mic. Yeah, uh, where's the mic? We got some, uh, some, someone back there. Okay, so yeah, this may be a, a multi-parter. Um, obviously, uh, in, in all uh, safety considerations, I, I assume that includes all security issues as well. Well, it, it, it does. Um, I've sort of stepped aside from that in particular, but there's, you know, there's a risk. It's like you, you don't want people to be able to say SSH, or excuse me, right. Telnet to your airplane. Right. Uh, to your flight uh, flight control software, right, either compromised or denial of service. So, so that gets into the question of if if you start collecting uh, data and you find out what you know what the ten you know most common bugs are, to what extent you know, it, or I guess d doesn't that raise the concern that then that might give a potential um, um, what would be uh, attacker uh, more information you know, uh, and possibly you know. Uh, more opportunity to actually compromise a particular system, and you know, if so, you know. I mean, the answer to that, the answer to that has to be, yeah, of course, you have to be concerned about that. I mean, that that's is is that not you know an ongoing debate in the open source community of how you handle security issues and and how do you even identify something that doesn't look like a security issue but ends up being a security issue? I. I you know, the, the answer is yes, and so we have to be always vigilant about defects. I mean, one of the things that is true of at least not, not all, but, but some security critical systems is that they're disconnected. If you are an airplane, you don't have, you're not trailing an Ethernet cable, so you're fairly disconnected. Uh, you, however, you still have radios. You probably don't use them for an in-flight software update. <laughs> Please don't use them for an in-flight software update. Um, uh, but there's other ones, uh, like, like I, I have a friend who, does, uh, who has a small company that does robots. Those probably are connected all the time. Maybe it could be hacked. I, I certainly hope not. Um, <laughs> I think when I have dinner with him next week, I should probably make sure that he has SSH and not tell Matt. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, one of the ideas, you know, should there be you know, some sort of a time delay you know, on, on reporting the, the bugs, you know, like wait two weeks or something. I think that's, a, that's not a bad idea. For something like this, where you're really concerned about the global reliability, a, a two week or a four week, whatever delay is of no consequence. And that's not a bad idea at all. Um, you know, give people a chance to, to do whatever they need to do. OK, any other comments, questions? Uh, anybody want to throw things at me? Anybody want more peng chocolate penguins? There's more over there. Uh, they, they sort of stopped on that, that chair over there. Uh, I did yeah. have a couple other really questions. Yeah. Um, 
to what, to what extent has, has um, you know, any of the uh, Linux source code been s subjected to uh, static analysis in, in comparison to? You, you missed a session just before this, right next door, and the answer is, thank you. The answer is um, it's been subjected to that particular torture to limited effect. Um, so they're talking about some LLVM derived tools. Um, also, what's their name? There's a uh, company. They started it. They're built on research at Stanford, and they do static analysis tools. Do you remember? Is it, is uh, it Coverity that you're referring to? Or? Coverity, that's it, yeah. So they, they actually have a fairly mature tool that does static analysis of the kernel. I'm a big fan of things like static analysis. Um, I'm not sure that the bugs get fixed, that Coverity turns up. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen anything that actually says that what happens to those bugs. They, you know, they run it, and those, it generates defects. And, and does anybody step up and say, I own this? I, I don't know. Does anybody know? That's not a false ah, here's, here's the microphone. Yeah, about Coverity, some Linux distribution vendors, they do run it against all packages, and people do fix bugs. The problem is there's a lot of false positives. Yeah, that's, and that's yeah. You can also, some of the data you cannot share because mm -hmm. of license concerns, so. Mm. Okay, uh, yeah, all right. So there's, there's, there's an answer to your question, is, is there not only is, are people running the tools, but in fact they are doing something with the data. That's a good sign. Um, all right, uh, anything else? All right, so uh, anybody who wrote your name down, I'll add you to the, uh, to the Google groups. Um, you can check out, it's the name of the Google group if you wanna just check it out uh, without having written your name down. It's safety-critical-linux. Uh, pretty, so that's, I think, fairly, fairly easy to find. Um, I'm fairly easy to find. Oh, I don't have my, my name. I'm David Vom Lane, uh, which I don't have up there. Oh, well. Um, anyway, so you can find the listing for this session, and you can find my name. And I'm, I'm almost the only David Vom Lane in the world, except there's this one guy somewhere in, I can't remember where he is. He's somebody young, so if it's, if you find him, it's not me, but I've got him beat by you know several hundred thousand Google matches. So that's that's what I do is spend all my time trying to be the only David Vom Lane on Google. That's not true. All right, thank you very much. Uh, if you just you know if you have other things you want to just send to me, send to me. I'm, this this matters a lot to me. Um, you know the, the driving down the highway was 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 cool. Going to SpaceX is cool. I also used to work for a company that no longer exists called Tandem Computers. They did fault tolerant computing. I really actually do care about reliable systems, and you can't get higher a higher standard. So let's you know put our heads together and maybe save some lives. All right. Thank you very much. More chocolate penguins. <laughs> They, you can't buy fewer than five pounds of chocolate penguins, so please take chocolate penguins. All right, take a bunch. <laughs>